The Tappet Brothers. The Tappet Brothers have a phrase, unencumbered by the thought process. And the modern criticism of speakers, be it Trump or Vladimir Putin or Megyn Kelly, appears to be totally unencumbered by the thought process. Mm -hmm. It's not too <laughs> fun. <laughs> Wouldn't want to confuse thinking with talking. <laughs> that was just extempore. I'm going <coughs> to do some other things that are a little bit more planned right now. For those of you who are new, I'm going to be saying a few things that are not uh, advertised because uh, I keep track of what my friends say on our email exchanges and my thought processes have been misunderstood or misinterpreted on a couple of occasions and I want to address that. It'll make sense to you in a few moments. I'm going to play something for you from the movie The Lion in Winter. Ah, oh, there you are. Well, have you put the terms to Philip? Not yet, but for shortly granting him an audience, I hope you'll all attend. Are we to know the terms, or would you rather tease us? Not at all. The terms are these. What are you giving to Philip? What of mine? Whatever you've got goes to me. And what's the nothing Geoffrey gets? My God, boys! You can't all three be king. All three of us can try? That's pointless now. I want you to succeed me, Richard. Alice and the Crown, I give you both. I've no sense of humor. If I did, I'd laugh. I mean to do it. What about me? I'm your favorite. I'm the one you love. I'm sorry, John. I can't help myself. Could you keep anything I gave you? Could you beat him in the field? You could. John, I won't be there. I'm losing, too. All my dreams for you are lost. Let me on. I never meant to. You're a failure as a father, you know that. I'm sorry, Johnny. Not yet, you're not, but I'll do something terrible and you'll be sorry then. Did you rehearse all this? Or are you improvising? Good God, woman, face the facts. Which ones? We have so many. Power is the only fact. What is the what only fact? What was the last line? Power is oh. the only fact. Oh, okay. And that is the line I want to emphasize because the misrepresentation that I feel occurred recently suggested that when I want to stop traffic in order to change public policy, that I had crossed over a, 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 an invisible line between the authorities and the subjects, when in fact I am fully aware that a line will exist, but neither I nor the authorities know where that line is until they and or I reach it. Um, probably all of you are familiar with the Occupy movement. The Occupy movement did a very good job of making the 1% a political reality. In the minds of the vast majority of Americans, the 1% now represent the ruling elite. The fact that the ruling elite almost certainly constitutes substantially less than 1% of the American population is really irrelevant. The 1% is a phrase that stands for the people who exercise power and impose that power on us. And the Occupy movement did a good job of making the American public aware of that. Now, the, the question involving power is this. The people with power will never surrender power voluntarily. At the same time, they don't want to reveal how much, how little power they really have. Because I guarantee you, if 99% of the American population went to Washington and New York and Chicago and stood in the streets, 
the one percent or whoever is in control of the military and the police would learn the lesson that Daly learned in 1968. You dasn't attack the group with greater power. And the students in 1968 rightly said, the whole world is watching. And Hubert Humphrey lost the election in 1968, in August, not in November. The last thing the ruling elites want to do is expose that their ultimate power is violence. Because if they can convince you and me that they have the power, then they have the power even if they don't really have it. So they don't know where that line is, where they are unwilling to cross, and neither do I. But I do know that the American public is as yet is as yet ununited in expressing their power of people. Now, perhaps in Brazil, where they don't have the traditions of democracy, the military would be willing to turn their machine guns on a certain percentage of the population that gathered in the streets. But remember back, and everyone in this room is old enough to remember it, remember back at the horror when four students were killed at Kent State. The Vietnam War was lost in the living rooms of the American public. It was lost at Kent State, not in Saigon. The ruling elite said, we've got to get out of here because we are losing control of the very people whom we need to control. So they got out. It took Nixon several years longer to actually get out. But the power actually rests with the people when they choose to exercise it. When they choose to exercise it. Now, everyone in this room went to an educational system where you were taught not to exercise your political power. Me. I won't be in the front lines of revolution because I'm too damn old. I will be in the back, in the second row though, because I want to encourage the youngsters with the energy and the intelligence and the determination to change the GD system. Now, I wanted to mention that not as an introduction to today's discussion, but in order to challenge the assumption that I don't, that I unwillingly or uh, unknowingly cross the line. Because I know I don't know where the line is, and I know that the ruling elite don't know where that line is, and they don't want to find out where that line is. They want to manipulate the 99% so that they never have to use violence. Violence is incredibly inefficient. If over the last five generations, they have convinced everyone in this room, A, that they have to pay income taxes, or B, that it is unpatriotic, to object to a damn silly war, excuse my French, I apologize for that, I, I genuinely do. I rarely use profanity. It, it, it almost always diminishes rather than <coughs> amplifies, but not always. The ruling elite do not want to use the power of violence because that is the surest way to delegitimize their own power. So, now on the question of income taxes and why you should pay them and why you don't really need to. I'm going to go through several quotations because I like them and then I will show you four sources. If you have to leave early I will tell you that there are three perfectly legal ways to avoid paying income taxes if you meet certain requirements. And just as it's not nice to fool Mother Nature, it's very hazardous to attempt to fool the Internal Revenue Service. So when you have to leave early, it's possible, and you're putting yourself at risk when you try.
Abraham Lincoln profoundly changed the character of the entity called the United States. He changed that between 1861 and 1865. So there is a certain amount of irony to this quotation that is attributed to Lincoln. Oh, come on. Maybe I'll. I would very much, okay, I'll do it this way. I'm gonna have to change this way I do it, but there this is Lincoln. There we go. The next one is Patrick Henry's. The Constitution is a tool by which the people restrain their government. Now, you may not have seen the Constitution used that way recently, but that was its intent in 1789. Thomas Jefferson had an understanding of what it means to live as a sovereign citizen. Liberty is unobstructed action according to our will within limits drawn around us by recognizing the same rights of others. And he didn't say within the law because the law is often written by tyrants. And it always does so when it violates the rights of the individual. Whether that means the right of the individual to purchase and smoke pot, to make and consume white lightning, or whether it is the right of the citizen to go fishing in a lake without wearing a life vest, or for that matter, without putting his safety belt on when he's driving a car. But it's okay to own slaves? Pardon? But it's okay to own slaves? It's okay for him to own slaves? Thomas Jefferson. I'm, A, he didn't think it was okay to own slaves. But he did. That's true, he did. You're accusing him, him of being inconsistent. No, no. Recognizing his inconsistency is perfectly appropriate to call attention to. I don't challenge that. I'm inconsistent on any of a number of things, and when I'm challenged on it, I usually have the courage to admit it. Thomas Jefferson was afraid. What would he do without those slaves? He was afraid because he knew how cruel the capitalistic system is. They'd have thrown him off Monticello and he would have to do the same work that the slaves were doing. Let, uh, permit me to go on with the other quotations okay. rather than, you know, you are, you are of course free to challenge each and every one. I'm not saying that they are the crystallization of all truth, but they might have some element of it. This goes, this quotation goes directly to the kind of people who annoy us the most, and sometimes that includes the person speaking. We're reluctant to admit that we owe our liberties to people, I'm sorry it says men, of a type that today we hate and fear. They are unruly men, they disturb the peace. They resent and denounce what Walt Whitman called the insolence of elected persons. They are free men. A radical is one who hates his country is naive and idiotic. He is more likely one who likes his country more than the rest of us and is thus more disturbed than the rest of us when he sees it debauched. He's not a bad citizen turning to crime. He's a good citizen driven to despair. Now remember, I'm admitting that these do not crystallize truth but they are spotlights illuminating areas of what is true. Frederick Douglass was an excellent analyst of the system he observed in the South as well as in the North. And when he delivered his discourse on the 4th of July, he told Northerners, what the hell do we have to celebrate your 4th of July for? 
Was that what oh, that I quote was? You can we go back one? I didn't get to read all of that no. quote. No. I'm sorry. Let's see if I can go back. Yeah, you can. There you go. The limits of tolerance are prescribed precisely and to the extent of the endurance of those whom they oppress. Going back to my comment, the power belongs to the people. As long as you've been convinced that you have no power, you don't have any power. You skipped on skip that one, one too. <clears throat> Can we go back one? Yep, there. we can go back as many yeah. as we need. Oh, that's wait. why I switched oh, to that's No, that's one, but when you went to the next, the next one, one, you skipped this, one. This, this is, this one is the one immediately after yeah. that. This, go, this, this it refers to the same one that I commented on a few moments ago. It is not legitimate to exercise power over somebody if you are doing it for his good. It is only legitimate to exercise power over somebody if he, was, if he is imposing harm on a third party. Hmm. Every single, and here you can write this down, every single imposition that has contributed to the delimitation of your power as a citizen has been created by the legitimate will to do something good for society or for the individual. Whether we're talking about seat belts, whether we're talking about consumption of alcohol, although in that case it was primarily to, to, to preserve the alcohol tax, or whether for a host of things. When, when the government made free speech illegal in 1918, they said it was for the public good. Guess what? It was really protecting the government's own political position in terms of entry into World War I. I love this one because it applies to 1918. It applies to so many things where we, where the politicians will tell us it's necessary to do. We have an emergency. So we have to violate the Constitution because we have an emergency. Necessity and expediency are not legitimate excuses for violating the Constitution which you swore to uphold and to protect, even during a crisis. I once had a very negative opinion of Alexander Hamilton, but the more I have read about why he said the various things that he said, the greater respect I have for Hamilton because he understood what sovereign citizenship meant and should mean. The re he would have argued that there's no reason to have a Bill of Rights appended to the Constitution. And from his point of view, he was absolutely correct. Because he was placing a great deal of weight on the reality of the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution. The Tenth Amendment says that any powers not herein granted to the federal government are reserved for the states or for the sovereign citizens of those states. So the only powers the federal government has are those which are delineated in the Constitution. Now the big, I'm sure they knew it, but the big gaping, um, what do they call uh, the hole that you can drive a truck through? The big exception. Yeah, yeah. Pardon? A gap. Well, yeah, but loophole. loophole, that's the word I'm looking for. The big loophole is the Constitution also grants Congress the power to enact statutes, quote, for the common good. 
unfortunately, that massive loophole has been used for a whole host of things that would have been restricted under the Tenth Amendment. I've already given you the bottom lines on my talk about income tax. These are the very best sources for informing yourself, because no one in this room, and I'm assuming you are all in your right minds, is going to believe me when I tell you that you do not have a requirement to pay a federal income tax. And on the assumption that you are in your right minds, none of you believe me. And you are wise to do so. So I want you to have the sources that you can follow through on. JohnHenryHill.wordpress.com is a website, it's a blog, written by a, an anonymous gentleman who at one point in time was a physician and he got his doctorate in law and he now either lives or has passed away in Europe. At one point in time when he was writing the blog, he had a house in Crimea and he had a house in Switzerland. What he has to say about American law is, not, it is something that you have never heard in school. I cannot summarize. I'll summarize a, a, a few little things, but I cannot begin to summarize it. But every article that he has written is still accessible, and I would encourage you to read it. Anna Reitzinger, also known as Anna von Reitz, is a much more difficult writer to read, but she has written a book along with um, James Belcher entitled, You Know Something Is Wrong When? And the when involves, let me just scan a few of these. You know something is wrong is when the President of the United States says one thing and then does the exact opposite repeatedly day after day. Members of Congress pass laws they admittedly don't read and then exempt themselves from the consequences. Millions of foreign nationals are entering the country illegally. I'm going to, uh, there's a, a list of these that are well worth reading. I'm going to add a few that she doesn't include. Uh, when you know people in high places are committing crimes with total impunity, when persons entrusted with enforcing the law quite intentionally neglect to enforce the law, especially when they, in, they neglect to enforce the law against people with power, but in enforce the law with incredible vigor if that person is poor or black or any of a number of other qualifications. When law is enforced sporadically and or um, whimsically, you do, in fact, know something is wrong. On everything that I've been able to check with Anna, she has been right, but she's irritating to read. It's only fair to tell you that. After you have read John Henry Hill, you'll be in a much better position to read Anna Reitzinger. Things that you can download from the web John Dale is a retired federal judge, and you can get PDF downloads on the internet entitled The Great American Adventure and The Legal Process. And there are several people who are new to this class. If somebody distributes a paper, I'll be happy to send out the websites to you. I will send out the websites to the people whose web addresses I already know, if you're interested in getting them. But you can Google these. I don't use Google, I use StartPage because I don't want, want Google following what I look at, but that's your business. Mitch Molesky has written basically a, a, a little book on what it means to be a citizen of the United States, and a major portion of that is describing the federal zone. 
the federal zone is that zone where citizens of the federal zone are in fact obligated to pay federal income tax. And the one of the ways, one of several ways that I know that it is in fact possible and legal to not pay federal income tax is that there is a commercial agency whose web address is weissparis.com that sells the service as to how to legally avoid paying federal income tax. I suspect their fees range in the vicinity of five to ten thousand dollars. That's just a guess because I didn't go. I might be off by a factor of ten because recognize the people who go to this kind of website are people who are intending to save hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of dollars not by investing in assets that have much lower income tax rates. They want to avoid taxes entirely. The qualification I have about Weiss Paris is this. The several techniques that I will tell you about and how on the basis of those techniques are predicated on abandoning your citizenship of the federal zone of the United States. And we'll, I'll describe what that federal zone is in a few moments. Weiss Paris takes the approach of waiting until the IRS takes you to tax court to seize your property. And when you get a notice from the tax court saying we are going to place a lien on your property, it is at that point that Weiss Paris intervenes, provides you with the tools for convincing the tax court that they do not have jurisdiction. Now, the, the beautiful element of that device is this. The first question any court asks and the, the answer to which eliminates all other questions is the question, does this court have jurisdiction? I will give you an example, a politically totally incorrect example. The Nuremberg Tribunals were, were legally an illegitimate court. Why? There had been no previous internationally recognized laws concerning warfare that were indictable in the fashion that the Nuremberg Tribunal attempted to and did indict the German high command. Robert Jackson knew this. The Nuremberg Tribunals were the last act of war. They were not an act of judicial jurisprudence. If a court has jurisdiction, no, if, let, let, put, let me phrase it this way. If a court does not have jurisdiction over my murdering everyone in this room, and they are the only court around, from a legal point of view, I get to walk. When the tax court becomes convinced that it does not have jurisdiction to impose an income tax on you or you or you, they drop the issue. And when the tax court drops the issue, the IRS drops the issue. So the question of jurisdiction is the first question that needs to be answered, and it is the last question that needs to be asked if the court does not have jurisdiction. All of the other techniques for avoiding income tax, which are in fact legal, place you at risk. They place you at risk because you have to be smarter than the IRS and the tax court for how to abandon your federal citizenship. So let's talk about federal citizenship. Do I have anything? Uh, I want to make sure. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about this next. The 
understanding up until the early part of the 20th century was that the Congress did not have authority to tax citizens of the sovereign states. Now, let's go back a little bit. When the United States federal government was established, it was established as a contract. It was established as a contract of a federal government exercising sovereignty over certain spaces and certain jurisdictions. And that contract, the federal government was one part of the contract and the other members of the contract were the individual sovereign states, at that point in time, 13. Each of the states were sovereign in their particular geographical territories. The United States was sovereign in the one territory that had been deeded it, the District of Columbia, and subsequently specific territories such as Guam, Puerto Rico, um, etc. I'm going to stop there because there's we get we get into messy messy areas when we're talking about the, the composition, the legal composition of the western territories of the United States. Each of those entities, the 13 sovereign states and the sovereign federal government of the United States, had sovereignty in their specific territories and only in their specific territories. The sovereign states of America deeded authority to the federal government to wage war and to manage interstate commerce. Not intrastate. Ohio State has sovereignty to manage the intrastate commerce of Ohio. And the sovereign Iowa State has the sovereign responsibility of managing intrastate commerce within Iowa State. The issue comes up. That's where the federal government has authority. Now, if you happen to be born in the District of Columbia, or in Guam, or in a federal institution in Iowa, that is an institution that is on land that has been deeded to the federal government, then you are a, a citizen of the United States of America. If, on the other hand, you were born in Cedar Rapids at Mercy Hospital, or born at uh, Children's Research Hospital in Chicago. You started out as a sovereign citizen of Illinois State or Iowa State. As a sovereign citizen of Illinois State. I'm using those phrases intentionally. You probably noticed there's a little difference in the way I'm talking about Iowa or Illinois, and I'll get to that in a second. You are not yet a citizen of the federal United States of America. And as such, you don't have any responsibility, notwithstanding what the Press Citizen or the Cedar Rapids Gazette or the New York Times tells you, you have no responsibility to pay your federal income tax. I was waiting for hands to come up. Surely there's going to be someone who's going to drop. What you're all doing is waiting for me to drop the other shoe. That's very polite of you. One of the maxims of law is that a presumption unchallenged becomes a, a fact on the issue in question. Let me repeat that. A presumption that goes unchallenged becomes a fact of law on the issue in question. The United States has presumed that you are going to volunteer to pay federal income tax. How many of you do not have a social security number? 
you have volunteered to become a U.S. citizen. By signing up for the Social Security system when you were 13 or 14 or 15, or maybe nowadays they're doing it at along birth. with your birth. At birth. At birth. At birth. See, when, when I was a kid, it, I applied for my Social Security number when I got my driver's license. Now it's at birth. So they're not taking any chances. They're going to get you as soon as they can. But this, okay. they started with the most venerable, you know, you know, you know, weakest. So welfare system. They started with welfare system. So You're they, absolutely Any benefit so-called where you apply for the benefit of the federal government of the United States, you have implicitly volunteered to pay your income tax. If you have ever applied for uh, an unemployment insurance, if you apply for a social security, um, if you ever sign the W-4, you know, the, 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 the form that your employer gives you when your very first job, if you have volunteered to have your employer withhold a certain portion of your wages, you have volunteered to pay income tax. Isn't it the uh, uh, line two instead of four? W-2-4? W the the W-2 is four? what they give you at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the year. The W-4 form is the one that you sign when you Begin first take with. the job. Okay. Any of those, and, and um, Mary is quite correct, any federal benefit, the federal government has the, claims the right, claims the right to the presumption that you are volunteering. And remember, a presumption unchallenged becomes a fact in law. Now, there is an interesting, do I have it here? Let's see what. That's why everyone believes that they are obliged to pay into. The tax court that Weiss Paris intends to convince does not have jurisdiction over your federal income taxes. That is an Article I court. Article I courts do not adjudicate matters of law. They adjudicate matters of policy. An Article III court is a court that decides what the law is. Article I court, including the tax code, determines whether this statute is being correctly applied in this circumstance. It's not a matter of law. So Weiss Paris gets, has the paperwork and knows how to do it to get you to make the correct declarations so that the tax court becomes convinced that you absolve yourself of the volunteering that you, they have presumed you to do. Now, that's a short message. Now, That's an impressive little speech, and I respect the intention both of the uh, speaker and the, of the uh, program. I'm going to point out that at least two uh, people of my immediate acquaintance were trained in the law, 
and subsequently decided that they no longer wanted to practice law, they became accountants. Now I know of a third party that stopped practicing law, but I don't know what he uh, wound up doing. I want to give you an example. The language called legalese is very closely related to the language called federal ease, both of which tend to use the same adjectives, nouns, verbs, adverbs as English, but they are substantially different languages. One of the chapters, one of the uh, references in Anna Wright's book uh, on You Know Something Is Wrong is, is a quotation from an almost indistinct section of, the, of a statute of Congress that was made uh, about 1863. And I can, I can pick it up and point it out. And the reason I know with some uh, uh, specificity is that it, she's made an error. She simply has made an error in, in her citation because I followed a couple leads and I found the actual citation that she wanted to use. And if you're ever interested, I'll point it out to you. But in that particular citation, the word person no longer means a living human being. The word person refers to a commercial entity such as a partnership, or a corporation, or a business. So, contrary to the idea that you think of as, of as a person, namely a living human being, according to the law, and this is well before the Supreme Court decided that a corporation was a person. You know, it was in the 1890s that a Supreme Court judge made the offhand comment that corporations are entitled to the same protections as persons. Because the you know, amendments uh, instituted after the Civil War guaranteed certain civil privileges and rights to persons. And in 1890, that was made a formal declaration of Supreme Court law. 30 years before that, Congressional statutes had defined persons as corporations, businesses, and partnerships. So, federal ease and legal ease use the same words, but with substantially different meaning, which is why it's not nice to fool Mother Nature, and it's hazardous to fool the IRS. So you better get some excellent instruction, whether it's from Weiss Paris or somewhere else. I'm not giving you tax advice, I'm just saying what's smart business, okay? If a judge, Joe. Uh, I wanted to point out that in 1960, there were a little over 200,000 lawyers in the United States and our population was 1.160 million people. Currently, our population is now about 320 million, but now there's almost 1.4 million lawyers. So the population doubled, the quantity of lawyers went up seven times. And the, curiously, the population of physicians has barely kept pace with the population, with the general population. That's partly a business decision of the colleges of medicine and partly a business decision of the colleges of law. The colleges of medicine want their graduates to have decent paying jobs. The colleges of law have decided that their graduates are going to make whatever their graduates are going to make. Well, the, the law business is entrepreneurial. That's so the more you can figure out to do or what you can figure out to do, you basically can do it as long as you stay within the group. That okay, Don? Okay. 
there was a case, uh, I'm going to point out a few, uh, just a few of the oddities of federal ease and legal ease. And the reason I'm pointing them out is when you read a statute, you need to be aware that the statute could very readily mean something totally different than what the simple words mean. A man and a wife go before court and the woman is pleading to be granted a divorce with some compensation. And the woman describes the way she has suffered living with this atrocious man. Spends 15, 20 minutes describing her suffering and using the word suffer. And the gentleman says, I did that, but I didn't suffer. The judge denies the woman's petition because in legalese, suffer means exactly what it meant in the King James Bible. When Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. <laughs> suffer in the King James Bible means to permit. And the woman says she permitted the man to do these things because she suffered him to do it. Okay? Uh, another case, a judge is dealing with a man who uh, is reported to have broken the speed limit and the man declares that he is, uh, does not give consent to the court and the judge says, do you understand me? This is your accusation, do you understand me? And the man says, judge, I do not understand you. I am an idiot. And they play this game back and forth. And the judge dismisses the charge of speeding and tells everyone else in the court who's waiting to be judged for the same kind of traffic offense, if any of the rest of you are going to claim to be idiots, you also can go. Why? Not because the judge is generous, but because the judge and the client are using legalese with the same meaning. Because when the man said, I do not understand you, he was saying, I do not stand under you. I do not recognize your authority. I do not stand in, under your authority as a judge. That's what understand means in legalese. When he said, I am an idiot, he was not declaring that he had no mental faculties. He was declaring that he was a sovereign citizen of the state and not subject to the authority of this judge who was, a, who was installed as a judge by the corporation of the state not by the landed state, but by the corporation, because it was a corporate judge. The vast majority of judges in the states of the United States are exercising their position of judgeship as officers of the corporation of the state in which they are practicing. It is, in fact, This book, tiny print, decently written, double column, and 400 pages, written by a man who's also written a, an essay that's available online, Gerald Allen Brown. Gerald Allen Brown has written a nice little e essay called Cooperative Federalism. And if you want to be a student, a sovereign, if you want to be a sovereign citizen of these United States and knowing what your rights and privileges as a sovereign citizen are, I encourage you to read the essay on corporate federalism. Mr. Brown uses the statements of the courts themselves to show that federalese uses the same words as English, but is a different language. 
Now, you don't have to read all 400 pages, but if you plan on escaping from the federal uh, income tax system, you'd better read the pertinent sections, at least. Legalese is very similar, but not identical. In fact, most of the examples I've given you are examples of legalese rather than federalese. The only example that I've used this afternoon of federalese is the definition that a person is in fact a corporation or a partnership. Good to see you, Joe. Paul? Yes? There's a letter online every Saturday and it's kind of a classic and it's by someone it's S. Jackson. It's 46 pages, and it, it's used by people. Let's see, the form is, a use, is useful as documentation of one's good faith belief in a lack of liability to pay income taxes. It is especially useful to have when prosecuted for willful failure to file. And it was written in 2005. A lot of people have used it, apparently, when they've gone and, and, and challenged. If you look at, I think, that if you get anything from the IRS, nowhere on it does it say United States. No. The, IR, the IRS is not an office of the federal government. Yeah. It, is, it, it is a contractual office. Mm -hmm. And the monies that you contribute to the federal government via the IRS are deposited quite directly into a bank in Puerto Rico. And those funds are used to pay the debt, the federal debt, to foreign lenders who have purchased treasury bonds. And secretary in the IRS is actually the secretary of Puerto Rico. I wouldn't doubt that. I did not know that, but I would not doubt that. Secretary Treasury. Pardon? I thought he's part of the Treasury. Of the Secretary of Puerto Rico. No, that the, that the IRS was part of this treasury. That's what I thought. Yeah. It seems like when you write out your check, you, if you don't write it to the IRS, you write it to the treasury. Yeah, treasury in the United States government. But, so U.S. Treasury. Yeah. US United treasury. States. That's really as much as I have to share with you because I could, I, I plan on next week on talking a great deal more about the mess the absolutely unconscionable legal mess that has eventuated from the Civil War. But A, I don't want to give away my ammunition this afternoon, and B, I couldn't begin to do justice of it this afternoon uh, and, and make sense of it. What I, the last parting thought is that there are three, there are three entities that are called the United States of America. One of them is the sovereign federal government of the United States of America that has sovereignty over the District of Columbia um, and its territories. The other United States of America is the federal government that is contracted with the sovereign states and it is legitimately called the United States of America. And the third de definition of the United States of America is the collective, the collective sovereign states geographically combined to, as, a, as a collective noun called the United States of America. All three of these are different. In addition to these three, there are three corporations, now there are actually more, but I can describe three corporations that are United States of America Incorporated, the United States of America Incorporated, and United States of America Corporation. Each of these in their turn have been the legal entity by which your federal government has conducted business. When you look at the Congress, you think you are electing representatives of Iowa State. You are actually electing corporate board members from the state of Iowa to the corporation, the United States of America Incorporated. 
And Pope Benedict XVI was absolutely amazed to find out that he, as the Pope, bore responsibility for the legal stability of the world. And he decided to resign, and Pope Francis took over from there. That's the last, that, that's just a hint as to what we're going to deal with next week. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Are you familiar with the uh, relationship between the IRS and two groups, the Eastern Cherokee and the Amana Society? I am not. I can say a few words about that. If Please you do. Know. Well, um, <laughs> explain how I learned this. Um, in the 60s, a young lady came to my house and rented a room from me. I found out that she was part of the Eastern Cherokee. And if you know a little bit about your history, you know, Remind me which president arrested the Cherokee and drove him to Oklahoma? Um, Grant, not Grant, um, Jackson. Jackson. Okay, I don't know. How is this illegal? He sent federal troops down and arrested 15,000 Cherokee, drove them on foot to Oklahoma in the middle of winter. And totally ignored the instructions of the U.S. Supreme Court right. in doing so. And most of the babies and the old people died in the way. Agreed. However, about a thousand of them hid out in the woods. The Cherokee mostly lived in North and South Carolina, some in Northern Georgia, Eastern Tennessee and Kentucky. And uh, the ones that hid out in the woods <laughs> are still there. And I found this out because this young lady uh, and I got to be friends and I met her parents and they invited me to visit them, which was very interesting. Because I got there and naively I asked, well, what is their address? No address. So I asked for directions to the house. And the only way I got directions was that her father ran a little um, tourist joint on the intersection of the highway. And she told him I was okay. And so he then gave me directions. This has an amazingly house. interesting parallel with another place that I'll mention. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I was amazed, but nobody in the Eastern Cherokee has an address. None of the streets have names. Uh, if you want to find somebody, you have to know an Eastern Cherokee well enough that they trust you and they will tell you how to get there. Uh, <laughs> there are some other interesting things I'll skip. Um, but I did, on a couple of occasions, privately, just on one-on-one, -on -one, ask somebody if they had a Social Security card. And I don't remember if they answered. And I asked if they paid federal income tax, and I didn't get any answer. So I don't know if they pay income tax. I, I know with 100% certainty. They don't have Social Security cards, and they don't pay income tax. Oh, OK. <laughs> I, did, I wasn't able to find that out. The, the reason they didn't trust you that much to answer the question. That's what they, they, they trusted oh. you a lot, but not yeah. enough to answer those questions. Yeah. Um, they trusted me enough that the, uh, her parents uh, gave me directions to a house they had previously lived in and let me stay over there overnight there for free. Beautiful. Which was a charming little house next to the street. But they didn't invite me to the house they're living in now, which was up the hill. I could see it. <laughs> so I can under you know, if you understand what they happened to their ancestors, I can understand that they're still very suspicious of And the outsiders. same, the, uh, virtually the identical same thing happened to the escaped slaves of Jamaica who went into the, the hills of Jamaica. And long after Jamaica achieved independence from Great Britain, you had these little villages scattered here and there speaking some, some approximation of English that I had to listen to for a long time before I could uh, speak to them, but they didn't have addresses, and uh, if you wanted to find the place, you had to know who was at that corner and who, who was at that corner, because mm -hmm. they, could, they, could, they could give you directions, but they were, direction, they were geographical directions. Right. They had no numbers or names <coughs> associated yeah. with them. Now, the other group is the Amana Society, which I'm sure you've all heard of, probably been there many times, but you probably don't very, know very much about it. No one in the Amana Society paid income tax until 1934. Did you know that? Well, 
To understand that, you have to first understand exactly what the Amana society is and isn't. It's not a religion. It's not a state. It's not um, a corporation. It's a society. And it's one of many that started in southern Germany as um, uh, utopian societies in the 19th century, and most of them came to North America to escape persecution in Europe. If you want to find out about this, you go to the Humanist Societies, and I think it's on a Sunday they give a tour of, the, of some of the houses, and the tour guide will tell you about their history. Um, they do not build churches. They think that churches, church buildings, cathedrals are a corruption and a useless expense and on the people. They have a Sunday service, but it's in your home, the Amish, in your living room. The Amish room. do the same thing. Ah. Yeah. And everyone takes a turn. So sooner or later, if you live in the Amanas, the Sunday service takes place in your home. Until 1934, they did not use money. No money. Nobody got paid for their work. Nobody paid for their food or their housing or anything. They thought money was corrupt. This is the Roman god Lucre. <laughs> and they were not going to adore an old Roman god. So what they did, if you lived in the Amana Society, uh, the society elders would tell you, oh, um, so-and-so over here is getting married next week, and they'll need a house. Now, you're a carpenter, you're a bricklayer, go over there and build a house for them. You would not get paid for it, but you would do it because the society gave you everything you needed. Houses in the Amanas don't have kitchens. Did you know that? Yeah. Because in every village, there is a cafeteria. So at mealtime, you go to the cafeteria, and you are served your meals. You do not pay for them. And uh, the people who cook the food are told, OK, it's your job today to do this. So everybody is told what to do. They have a furniture factory. You probably knew about that. They have a woolen mill. They once dug a canal from the Iowa River to turn a um, what, the water power? Yeah, ran water, the mill. water mill. They still do weave cloth there. Do they still live like this? Yeah, it all changed in And it all changed what? in 1934. And how did it change? The, I, I, because the I, IRS started harassing them. Okay, there was a big change. And the IRS decided there shouldn't be these people out here who didn't pay income taxes. Mm -hmm. And they lived very nicely. They all had nice homes, clean homes. They had enough food to eat. Uh, the only way that you could, if you didn't like this Amana society, you could leave. And some have. Probably a couple leave every year and go elsewhere enjoying other 